device fully operational sir excellent bring in the other subjects <laughs> My name is Francis Bruss. I'm the audio director here at Rip Arrows. So my day-to-day -day job is to figure out special ways to creep people out and to make audio an integral part of the Outlast brand. From the VO recordings, from music, from sound effects, from integration, pretty much all the, all, all the facets of audio is, uh, is what I do. Having a new composer for the game is a huge, huge part of Outlast Trials. That's something that we're so excited about because the whole goal of having Tom as a composer is using his ability to tie everything together into one unit of a game. 
Tom has an amazing background in video games. I can't list half of the game that he's worked on. He gives master classes to other composers. So for him, he was just incredibly motivated to be part of Outlast Party. Hi, I'm Tom Salta, and I'm the composer for the original score to Outlast Trials. You know, working with Red Barrels was really a fun and unique experience for me, and working with Francis was uh, just incredible. What I really like about it, 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 it's also challenging but fun at the same time, is that I came on a bit earlier than I normally do. Uh, on a lot of these kind of big AAA games, whether it was Battlegrounds or Ghost Recon, Halo stuff, I usually come on right at the end. Things are happen fast. With Outlast Trials, it's different. It was earlier in the development stage, and it's giving me a chance to see it come to life and maybe contribute ideas that can affect the mechanism of the game itself, which is like, this is amazing, because it's like, you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store. So for the theme of Outlast Trials, we obviously wanted this to be really super special. And um, me personally, you know, given my, my love of this game uh, and the music that I'm doing, I, I wanted it to, to check off a few things that I really didn't have much precedent for. I wanted something that was just purely scary to listen to. I wanted also something that had some melody to it, something that was memorable but also with a melody, and something that was simple enough that you could just play it on a piano. One of the first things that, um, that came to mind, and I don't know where it came from, was that little phrase that da ba da ba ba da ba That was like, wow, okay, that, that, that feels right. It, finding that simple idea that you immediately know it's Outlast Trials and it immediately scares you. And then seeing that come to life when we developed the theme and then brought in the full orchestra, I mean, that was like, yes. <laughs> it's alive. Fifty percent of the experience is audio driven. It is the immersion factor that will pull the player in, that'll keep the player within the world, and it'll keep that tension. Those build-ups or really releases down to zero, that I think the audio is the main, main factor in that, and that's how we keep the player stuck in the game, in the world with us. Uh, that's going to be the challenge, and I think we're, we're, we're up to it. We're up to it. Another thing that is so much fun with creating the music for Outlast Trials is it just gives me the opportunity to get some props and try to come up with some textures and sounds that really are terrifying, but based on, you know, 50s technology or toys or things like that. I went on eBay and I found this thing. I mean, you know, an innocent plaything can be very terrifying. My, my kids get scared when I show this to them. I think they've seen too many horror movies, but. You know, what's scary about this? <laughs> Woo, apparently a lot. Taking those things and, and, and using them to create scary sounds, textures, and music. I mean, come on. I'm getting paid for this? Outlast has this history of creating those very iconic enemies, and I feel like fans are expecting us to deliver those iconic enemies again in a different level. We try to kind of figure out how the infection is going to work in the characters with all the new mechanics and with all the new abilities that we have, but we don't want to make it like too high in terms of technology because in the 50s, everything was a little bit more limited. My job is basically kind of trying to do a lot of the research of how to make something that looks high tech look like low tech and give this 50s uh, twist to it. 
And it, it, it's pretty fun because uh, at the end of the day, I have a lot of possibilities of creating those characters and trying to portray a little bit of their daily basis. My favorite character, it's Gooseberry. I was completely intrigued by her story because she is this TV show host for kids. But like off camera, she has this whole like dark side and she's supposed to look like motherly looking. She's supposed to have this like motherly feel for kids. But in reality, when you look at it, it's a completely different story. <laughs> Because it's an Outlast game, it needs to feel off, in a way. Like, he had this super jolly face, that she's pretty, she is perky, and but her face needed to be removed. And we had all these, like, references of prothesis of people that go to war and they lose their face, they have their face burned. And the couple of first sketches, it was already way too off, and this is something that we wanted to avoid. You know, we, we had something, but it was not there. So the moment I did the third interaction with her was the moment that they were like, all right, we have something there. Gooseberry is a double character. She has major daddy issues and the puppet is the full representation of her father, which was a horrible person. And from there, we pass it over to uh, the 3D team where they did an amazing job portraying her in her most beautiful way. Coyle is our second Prime Asset in the game. He is this police officer with a very distorted notion of law. Whatever you think it's right, he's gonna put his twist on it. He likes to torture his victims with electricity in many different ways. He has this sort of fetish of sexual assaulting people with his baton. Koyo is not only about the mechanic of playing, but also the background and his twisted ways of showing love. Thank you for volunteering for the therapy. There is a lot of anxiety on my part because creating a game takes a lot of time and creating those characters, making them come through and like, you know, shine. It takes a long time because it's a collective effort. Animation, effects, programming, you know? Until we actually see the full thing, it might take like three, four years, if not more. Because these are very important characters at the end of the day and, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Carl Schniara. I'm a psychiatrist. This is the Allen Memorial Institute. It's a great training center, but it's also where Dr. Cameron's experiments occurred, uh, linked with MKUltra. MKUltra was a large secret operation by the CIA that ran from 1953 to 1973. That was in the early days of the CIA. Their basic aim was to find ways to modify behaviors. The director of the hospital, this famous psychiatrist, Dr. Donald Ewan Cameron, was experimenting on, on patients. He claimed he could remove certain unhealthy patterns in the mind of patients and replace it with healthier patterns. So that uh, intrigued the CIA. They first uh, funded all kind of research that was going on. So things like mild-altering drugs, things like how to implant a device in the brain and remotely control somebody. So there was research going on, but uh, they only went so far. What they did that was much more unethical, they became rather obsessed with uh, LSD, and they did all kinds of weird experiments with it. They hired prostitutes to slip LSD to clients unknowingly, and then they would observe whatever occurred. They even would give LSD to CIA employees uh, without their knowledge, just to observe what it does. Uh, so that's really dangerous. I mean, today, it absolutely sounds like it's a conspiracy theory, but it actually happened. You can imagine that having things like sleeper agents, controlled assassins, you know, would be kind of the perfect spies. A sleeper agent, uh, in theory, is an agent uh, spy that doesn't know that he's a spy, that he can be activated from a distance. So in my opinion, if the CIA, or if anybody really could crack mind control, they would have the most devastating weapon in human history, more than nuclear weapons. Get back! <laughs> Fans can expect on from trials uh, is is more suffering, I guess. 